Today is April 22nd, 2024. The conflict in Ukraine continues, and there have been some uh, recent significant developments, including the United States government finally passing its spending bill for Ukraine of $61 billion. I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, let's take a look at the map. This is liveuamap.com. It's a pro-Ukrainian map, so please keep that in mind when looking at uh, the situation on the ground according to it. Now, as you can see, there are a number of air defense icons inside Russia. They're talking about a large wave of drones sent by Ukraine into Russia and Russia claiming to have intercepted them. And they have all these other icons on here, including this one where it's talking about a 61 year old businessman being shot and killed. And if you go to the, the link and you, you look at this news story, it's a random murder, possibly uh, a, a business deal gone bad, a personal grudge and and this pro-Ukrainian map is just putting that on on their map. Uh, for what reason, I don't know. Maybe for a lack of any other sort of positive news, or I should say negative news they can spin regarding Russia. Uh, let's continue looking at it. Let's uh, move in a little bit closer. You can say, again, even this pro-Ukrainian map is admitting strikes being carried out all across Ukraine from Kharkov in the northeast, Zaporozhia in the south, uh, the Dnipro Pro, uh, Trosk was also hit recently in recent days, uh, major missile and drone strikes carried out by Russia. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more in just a bit. Uh, but what I wanna do is zoom in here, uh, just west of Avdivka from my last update about a week ago, I was talking about Berdichi, and uh, at the time, it was not secured by Russian forces. Now you can see that it was, and actually this map has uh, a way of s searching on the timeline. So this is the 21st, let's just go back to say the, the first. And you, you could see uh, earlier this month, Berdichi was still in Ukrainian hands. And now you can see it and other locations along this part of the line of contact are now secured and held by Russian forces. And so this is happening all along the line of contact in the Donbas region. And that is where Ukraine is right now on the battlefield. They are not stabilizing the front line their defenses are crumbling and as they do russian forces are incrementally moving forward there is no attempt here for a major breakthrough or a big arrow offensive it is simply the russian military continuing to do what it has been doing all along this steady war of attrition this incremental uh, uh, movement forward on the battlefield as Ukrainian forces collapse and fall back. And then we had heard after Russia secured Abdiivka outside of Donetsk, in the Donbas region, we had heard from Ukraine itself, its Western sponsors, that they had stabilized the line of contact and it turned out that that was not true. And we remember, and uh, I'm going to talk about Ukrainian air defenses here in a moment. We remember hearing these stories about Ukrainian air defenses shooting down several Sukhoi Su-34 fighter bombers every single day. There were there were stories about Ukraine shooting these planes out of the sky. And at one point, there were pro-Ukrainian sources claiming that the skies over the Donbas had been cleared of all, of all Russian military aviation. Of course, that never happened. Uh, Su-34 fighter bombers continued all along the line of contact, dropping large numbers of glide bombs, actually increasingly larger numbers of glide bombs, uh, whittling down Ukrainian defenses, forcing Ukrainian forces to pull back, causing Ukraine to continuously lose territory, however incrementally. Uh, so that brings me to uh, this story about a Tupolev 
TU-22M3 bomber. These are the these are one of several warplanes that Russia is using to launch standoff weapons. These are long-range missiles fired by these aircraft uh, far from Ukrainian air defense systems, far from Ukrainian territory altogether. The missiles have a long range specifically to afford these aircraft the ability to fire them without ever coming in range of enemy air defenses. And uh, we hear this claim and uh, this this was actually April nineteenth, so it's a couple of days ago, and we have not we have not really heard Ukraine or or its Western sponsors really picking this story up. So it's one of these baseless claims that Ukraine makes, presenting no evidence and a, a claim that is uh, very tenuous at best. It says Air Force Ukraine downs. Russian Tu-22M3 bomber for first time, and they admit that the aircraft went down in Russian territory after uh, an attack on the Dnipropetrovsk oblast. The, the attack took place. It was a success. Ukraine in this article claims that they intercepted two missiles. Many more missiles obviously got through and did their damage. They claim they forced another aircraft to turn around however again the the attack was carried out successfully this plane went down in russian territory so in order for this to to have happened and ukrainian air defenses having shot it down it means they would have had to intercept it close to ukrainian territory within range of ukrainian air defenses hit the aircraft and the aircraft instead of immediately falling out of the sky was able to make it well within russian territory before finally crashing and they're claiming that it was a an s200 air defense missile of all of all weapon systems they're claiming it was a an s200 very old uh, soviet era air defense missile which has a, a maximum range of something like 300 kilometers variants that had extended ranges had a, a range of maybe 300 kilometers the the kh-22 cruise missiles that these tu-22 m3 bombers were firing have a, a range of more than twice that and so how did this happen why why would russia be using standoff weapons specifically to keep their warplanes out of range of ukrainian air defenses uh, and still somehow come within range of Ukrainian air defenses and have one of their bombers shot down. I don't know. I cannot discount the possibility that Ukraine, together with NATO, came up with some way to ambush these bombers right at the very, very edge of their approach uh, to their targets in Ukraine. Maybe there was some way that they managed to do this. If more bombers fall out of the sky, Maybe we can give a little credibility to this claim. Uh, at the moment, I'm going to go with the most likely possibility, which is a malfunction, an accident, a technical problem that caused uh, the bomber to crash, which happens. It happens in peacetime, and it most certainly happens in wartime. If it was a Ukrainian ambush, an, a, 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 an air defense ambush of some kind R russia will know that that is what happened even if they don't want to admit it and they will avoid it in the future they will take advantage of the very long ranges of these standoff weapons and they will stay out of range of uh, whatever means ukraine and its western sponsors used to ambush this bomber if that is even what happens again i was just talking about these c uh these su-34 fighter bombers that ukraine claimed what they were shooting out of the sky several uh, per day for a week or two. Uh, and that clearly never happened, not in the way that they described. And it is very likely that they're just grasping at headlines here as well. Now, we continue to see Ukraine carrying out sporadic attacks within Russian territory, attacks on infrastructure, oil refineries, uh, we just have to keep in mind that when we see these stories in the media we have to remember that ukraine is not carrying these attacks out uh, in the in the frequency that russia is nor on the scale that russia is russia is carrying out these type of attacks 
on Ukrainian infrastructure and military targets at a much greater frequency and a much larger scale. And they're conducting these attacks on Ukraine, which is a much smaller country geographically. Uh, these assets that Russia is targeting are concentrated in that geographical area in terms of Russian infrastructure, potential targets. We're talking about the largest country on Earth in terms of geography, land area. Uh, that infrastructure is more numerous and spread out much further. And Ukraine has fewer means to carry out attacks, both in terms of frequency and scale. So the, the idea that Ukraine is matching Russia in this these long range strikes is absurd. They are not, they cannot. This is for headlines. This is not disrupting Russian economic activity. It is not disrupting uh, its energy industry. It is not going to disrupt its military industrial base or its military operations in and around Ukraine. There are a growing number of Western headlines talking about Ukrainian defeat. And uh, I have talked about this recently in a live stream uh, that I did on the Duran. I want to show these headlines again here so people can, can see for themselves. Uh, this is from Politico. April 17th, 2024. Ukraine is heading for defeat. The West's failure to send weapons to Kiev is helping Putin win his war. And the idea here is that this delay in Washington to pass the $61 billion in aid, this is causing uh, Ukrainian military capabilities to collapse, defenses to fall, territory to be lost. Uh, and as I pointed out many times, as uh, Alexander Mikuras of the Duran just pointed out in his uh, recent video, this has nothing to do with money. This has everything to do with the collective West's military industrial capacity. Their capacity is simply too small to provide Ukraine with the quantities of weapons and ammunition it needs to match or exceed Russian firepower. And again, both in terms of scale and frequency. Uh, we have this article here from the BBC. Ukraine could face defeat in 2024. Here's how that might look. And then this is all about talking with Ukrainians themselves who, who admit how, how bleak the situation is. Uh, the BBC is trying to anticipate where some large Russian offensive might take place. But as I've said, Russia's entire approach to the special military operation has been one of attrition, simply grinding down Ukrainian forces. There's no need to mount a large-scale offensive trying to break through prepared defenses when you can simply just continue grinding them down as they have been. Uh, as, as we hear about Russian forces suffering catastrophic losses, both in terms of manpower and equipment, I just want to point uh, this headline out. Uh, so the Western media is talking about Ukraine losing. They're talking about the need to send more aid to Ukraine. We've heard the argument made by Western political and military leaders that this is a great investment because uh, through this proxy war, the United States and its allies are waging against Russia and Ukraine. They've managed to wipe out half of uh, Russia's pre-war military capabilities and yet we have articles like this from the business insider russia's army is now 15 percent bigger than when it invaded ukraine says u.s general this is april 11th 2024 this is the current nato supreme ally commander of europe and and he was saying this to the house armed services committee in a hearing uh, over the past year, Russia increased its frontline troop strength from 360,000 to 470,000. Conscription age was raised from 27 to 30, hardly, hardly the extremes that we see Ukraine resorting to. Uh, and it's also mentioned that the pool of available military conscripts has been increased by 2 million for years to come. 
In sum, Russia is on track to command the largest military on the continent. Regardless of the outcome of the war in Ukraine, Russia will be larger, more lethal, and angrier with the West than when it invaded, he said. So this is the reality that the West is incrementally coming to grips with as Russia incrementally advances on the battlefield and as Ukrainian military capabilities are incrementally ground down. I want to talk about Russian losses here a little bit more. I want to talk about this recent BBC article. Uh, what it's trying to say and what it's actually saying are two entirely different things. Uh, this is the, the headline. Russia's meat grinder soldiers, 50,000 confirmed dead. Uh, and uh, they're talking about this project with Media Zona that I've talked about often. And they're tracking what they claim are confirmed deaths by the B BBC Media Zona. Right down here, they, they say this is the, the source of this graph. And if you look at the graph, they have regular fighters, civilian recruits, unknown. All three categories, if you made a line diagram, you can see in all three categories, confirmed deaths are decreasing over time. Uh, regular fighters decreasing, civilian recruits decreasing, unknown, whatever that means, also decreasing. So we're hearing about catastrophic Russian losses, but their, their own graph is showing us that Russian losses, as this conflict continues, their losses in terms of manpower are decreasing. Does anyone believe that Ukrainian manpower losses are decreasing as they run out of arms and ammunition as they retreat on the battlefield. Does anyone believe that they are also decreasing in terms of manpower losses? Uh, and an interesting thing about this article is media journalists are supposed to try to present a balanced picture of any given situation. The article hardly talks about Ukrainian losses at all. This is the, the one mention of it in the entire article. It says Ukraine, meanwhile, rarely comments on the scale of its battlefield fatalities. In February 2024, President Vladimir Zelensky said 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers had been killed, but estimates based on U.S. intelligence suggests greater losses. And U.S. intelligence also suggests greater losses for Russian forces, uh, but they are, of course, simply repeating what Ukraine, its Ministry of Defense, claims regarding Russian losses, which is some, somewhere around 300,000. You can see the disparity between that number and what this BBC Media Zona project are suggesting. What's interesting is that at the very end of this BBC article, there's another article dated June 2023. It says, Russia doesn't count its war dead, so we did. And what about Ukraine? They just admitted in this article, Ukraine doesn't count their war dead. Are they, are they counting Ukrainian war dead as well? N no, apparently not. They aren't. I wonder why that might be. Now, let's talk about Western military support for Ukraine. Let's talk about the most recent news. This is from The Guardian. This is April 20th, 2024, U.S. House approved $61 billion in military aid for Ukraine after months of stalling. Uh, if, if people who have been following my updates on the conflict in Ukraine recall, when the first uh, delay was apparent regarding the $61 billion, I said that it was a certainty that eventually it would pass. The, the U.S. is not going to abandon its own proxy war that it itself has engineered over the course of, of several years. The most likely explanation as to why there was a delay is the fact that they simply have nothing to put together into a, an arms and ammunition package. Now, several months have passed, and as I have been explaining for two years now, as the U.S. and the rest of NATO, their stockpiles are exhausted, they will depend entirely on monthly production numbers, which are not high and won't be high for many years to come. So if you want to put a weapons package together, you need to wait several months before you have enough that is 
presentable to the public so it doesn't look like you've run out of arms and ammunition as the U.S. and its allies have actually done. So uh, they're passing this. The Senate is almost certain to approve of it. It will move forward. The Pentagon on its website is going to post a list of what is being sent to Ukraine. I will cover that when it is published. It most likely is going to reflect an accumulation of monthly production over the months this spending bill was delayed. And it will look relatively large, but as I will break down when it is finally published, it is still entirely insufficient to sustain Ukrainian forces, even in the state that they're in right now, this incremental retreat that they are in the process of. And I've seen euphoria across the, the pro-Ukrainian, pro-Western, pro-NATO circles, uh, across social media, uh, Western analysts covering this, this idea that this is some uh, massive breakthrough and a relief for Ukraine. It, it is not. Uh, I just want to show you, and this is a point Alex Christoforo of the Duran made in one of his recent videos. He was saying, considering all the money that has, spent, has been spent on Ukraine up until this point and considering the outcome, and that was when the U.S. and its allies had stockpiles full of weapons and ammunition they could send to Ukraine. If they could not accomplish anything then, what is this $61 billion going to accomplish now after their stockpiles have been exhausted and as Ukraine's military has been uh, decimated in terms of manpower, which I, I, I will talk about here in just a minute. Here's the Council on Foreign Relations. It's one of these U.S. government corporate financier funded think tanks. This is from February 2024, and they're talking about all the funding up until February 2024. So from January 24th, 2022, and January 15th, 2024, how much aid has the U.S. sent to Ukraine? You'll notice that this predates Russia's special military operation, which began in actually February of 2022. And you can see it's a total of 74 billion, 74 billion. And they break it down, humanitarian, financial, security assistance, weapons and equipment, grants, and loans for weapons and equipment. And of course, the 61 billion being passed now is not 61 billion for weapons and ammunition. A small percentage of it will be for that. And they also still need to cover all of these other areas uh, in terms of assistance. I also wanna show you this. This was April 20th, 2024 from the US Department of Defense statement by Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin III on the House passage of the National Security Supplemental, which that 61 billion is included. And it says the legislation is also an important investment in America's future by providing approximately 50 billion that will flow directly into our defense industrial base this bill will create good American jobs in more than 30 states, even as it reinforces U.S. long-term security. It's the whole reason the U.S. has run out of weapons and ammunition to send Ukraine, the whole reason production cannot be increased sufficiently to, to rectify this in any reasonable time frame, is because this defense industrial base in the United States and across the collective West is corrupt, incompetent, inefficient. It is a for-profit industry. Uh, it is concerned with maximizing profits over all other considerations, including producing uh, large quantities of quality weapons and ammunition needed to sustain a conflict of the scale. And I've pointed this out. Uh, when this was released, uh, this is also the US Department of Defense. DOD releases first defense industrial strategy. I covered this in depth uh, and if you read through the entire report all it talks about is the for-profit private industry that makes up the u.s military industrial base and how that for-profit mentality inhibits the u.s from achieving all of its strategic goals and objectives all around the globe which is ironic because it's these corporations and financial financier interests that set these objectives in the first place, and yet their short-term obsession with profit over purpose prevents them from even achieving their own 
laid out objectives in terms of expanding globally, reasserting primacy around the globe, subordinating peer and near peer competitors like Russia, China, now Iran. And the reason why this is, is because this mindset has been developed over the course of decades. You could even say generations. The West enjoyed for many generations a large disparity in terms of military, economic, and technological power over the rest of the world. The playing field has since leveled, and they have not changed their mentality to reflect that. They still move forward as if they have all of these advantages in terms, and, and if you read the, in this report put out by the Department of Defense, they even say in the report that the United States still maintains the, all of these advantages in terms of technology and, and innovation, when in reality they don't. Uh, and so this is the reason why the United States and its its allies across the collective West, their, their proxies uh, elsewhere around the globe, this is why they cannot compete with just Russia alone, saying nothing of this wider conflict the U.S. is pursuing against uh, not just Russia, but also China, Iran, even North Korea. I think that was thrown in recently uh, by U.S. political leaders, uh, all of these countries as part of the, act, the, the new axis of evil. Before news of the spending bill passing the, the, the U.S. House of Representatives, there was this article from Politico, Pentagon prepares to send artillery air defenses to Ukraine as House approaches vote. So now we know the vote passed. This was April 19th, 2024. The article says the Pentagon is preparing to quickly approve a weapons package for Ukraine that includes urgently needed artillery and air defenses as Congress lines up votes to pass additional funding for the country, according to two U.S. officials. There's another one from the BBC uh, here. Ukraine weapons, what arms are being supplied and why are there shortages? That's, a, that's interesting. One shortage faced by Ukraine is for air defense missiles such as US-made Patriots. Ukraine needs long-range interceptor missiles to counter Russia's glide bombs. Is using the pound defensive positions in civilian targets like power stations, says Dr. Marina Miron of King's College London. Imagine using Patriot, Patriot missile interceptors to try to intercept scores of glide bombs falling on Ukrainian positions all along the line of contact every single day. Imagine that. That is completely implausible. That will never happen. Not now. Not if the U.S. spent 100 years trying to expand Patriot missile production. It would, it would never work out. The, the economics there simply do not add up. Its armed forces are also limited to firing 2,000 shells a day, according to the U.S.-based think tank, the Royal United Services Institute, or RUSI. In contrast, Russian forces have been firing up to 10,000 shells a day, says RUSI, which adds that Russia is getting almost 3 million shells a year from its own factories and from North Korea. Lack of artillery is one of the reasons Ukraine cites for its loss of Abdiivka in the eastern part of the country in February. The EU failed to meet its target of sending 1 million shells to Ukraine by the beginning of March, and its leaders are agonizing over what happens over what weapons to give Kiev, says BBC diplomatic correspondent James Landell. However, in March, the Czech Republic agreed a $1.5 billion deal for a group of 18 NATO and EU countries to buy 800,000 rounds, both 155 millimeter and 122 millimeter caliber from outside the EU. And as I've been saying all along, production of these munitions, air defense, interceptors, artillery shells, is simply insufficient across the West. It is not something that can be increased overnight. It takes years to do. The US has already maxed out its ability to expand artillery shell production. It's in the process of doing it. And that was actually incidentally set up before the special military operation even began. They were already in the process of expanding artillery shell production. By 2025, 2027, between these, these years, uh, they plan to 
uh, reach certain targets that will still fall far short of what Russia is currently manufacturing, not what Russia will be manufacturing by that time. In terms of uh, Patriot missile interceptors, I will get into that in just a minute, but I want to talk about this Czech-led artillery initiative. This is from Kiev Independent. This is a pro-Ukrainian source. Czech PM allies contract first 180,000 artillery shells for Ukraine. So that that sounds like good news, right? 180,000 rounds on their way to Ukraine right now, right? Uh, wrong. It says there uh, these will be delivered to the Ukrainian front in the coming months. So it will take months to supply 180,000 artillery shells to Ukraine. How long does 180,000 artillery shells last if Ukraine is firing 6,000 shells a day as they had been before the rate dropped down to 2,000 per day? That's about a month's worth of artillery shells. So it will take months to deliver a month worth of artillery shells. Do you, do you see what the problem is here? There's another article. This one's a little bit older. The, the headline is still not enough funds for Czech initiative to buy shells for Ukraine, Estonia's defense minister. Now, since this article was written in March, more funds were made available. So let's just assume that the funding is there. There's another interesting point made in this article. It says it is difficult to predict when the shells might be delivered to the front. This is what I said in my last update that it's not going to be they were they were talking about finding a million to two million shells available for ukraine and people were assuming that uh, they were just assuming the most optimistic outcome that two million shells are on their way to ukraine and i said that these are all different calibers some of them are irrelevant to what ukraine actually needs they've been in storage for long periods of time some of them may not even be capable of being used and then just the logistics of collecting them from all of the different countries they are in around the globe and moving them to Ukraine is not going to happen all at once. Ukraine's not going to receive all of these regular large intervals. They're going to be receiving them in small amounts here and there whenever it is possible to find, buy, and send them if they are even capable of being used. And it even says that in this article. It says some may arrive in a few months and some by the end of the year. A lot depends on the fact that we need to physically check some of the shells of these possible partners. We were told that we can get shells there, but in what condition they are, whether they are even suitable for use, all this needs to be checked. So this is far from a solution. This is grasping at straws and they put these headlines out there to raise everyone's hopes to boost morale this is a serious problem in ukraine especially but it is not actually a formulated solution they they don't even know exactly how many shells are going to be usable and they don't know when they're going to get them they don't know how many they're going to be able to send to ukraine and if you are a commander a Ukrainian commander, and you're even just trying to plan a defensive strategy, not knowing how many shells you're going to have month to month is, is going to create a huge problem. Now let's talk about air defense. We just, we just heard a so-called Western expert talking about Patriot missiles being used to shoot down glide bombs. Uh, incomprehensible. There's, there has only been 10,000 Patriot missiles ever made. In the, whole, in the whole world ever. Russia alone, and I, I've pointed this out many times before, Russia alone in the last two years has launched over 8,000 missiles and 4,630 drones. And for every incoming target, air defense operators to, to maximize the probability of intercepting these incoming targets will usually launch two interceptors. So. 8,000 times 2 is 16,000. That is more, many more uh, than all Patriot missiles ever made. And they're not even talking about glide bombs, which are now being dropped in, in the hundreds, in the hundreds, week to week. I've talked about Patriot missile shortages before the first Patriot missile system was even sent to Ukraine. There was a Patriot missile shortage 
uh, owed to Saudi Arabia's war with neighboring Yemen. They were trying to intercept incoming missiles and drones, and they were exhausting their supply. They were drawing Patriot missile interceptors from neighboring countries until the U.S. was able to scrape together enough to ship to Saudi Arabia. So even before the first Patriot missile systems and interceptors were sent to Ukraine, there was already a shortage. Now the Patriot missile system is being used in unprecedented quantities. Production simply cannot keep up. There's somewhere between 500 and 600 Patriot missiles being made every year accounting for the fact that they're trying to increase production year to year it, it will not exceed 600 not now not not years to come and so you can see the problem for ukraine and you can see how no amount of money passed by congress to hand to ukraine or to hand to u.s arms manufacturers is going to fix this problem uh, even if they took all of this money and used it to expand production, that is a process that would still take years to achieve. But they're not even talking about doing that. Now, as a stopgap, uh, or as a, a, a desperate alternative, because there simply are not Patriot missiles to send to Ukraine in any significant number, uh, I think people may remember this. This was the Hawk air defense system. It was sent to Ukraine months ago. We never heard anything about it since. It has been used by the United States for, I think, over 20 years, maybe 30 years. Uh, it was last used by the U.S. Marine Corps, which is always the last to, to stop using an obsolete system. And then uh, the U.S. military was transferring over the Stingers and the Patriot missile system. We didn't hear about the Hawk air defense system. I talked about how antiquated it was. The, the systems were, were never going to make any sort of difference. Now they're talking about $138 million for Hawk air defense upgrades from Reuters. The United States will sell Ukraine up to $138 million worth of equipment to maintain and upgrade its Hawk air defense systems to help defend against uh, Russian drone and cruise missile attacks, a U.S. State Department official told Reuters. The U.S. began shipping Hawk interceptor missiles to Ukraine in 2022 as an upgrade to the shoulder launch Stinger air defense missile systems because they were out of Stingers, which is the newer missile. They were out of stingers. They sent the older Hawk system simply because they literally had nothing else to send Ukraine in quantities. Uh, they're, they're saying that the stinger is a smaller, shorter range system, which, which is technically true, but it is newer and is more modern than the Hawk system. Although Ukraine has run out of many sources of U.S. funds, Kiev was given a grant of $300 million in foreign military financing as part of its annual defense spending bill recently signed into law the grant money will be used to pay for the equipment which includes engineering and integration for communications refurbishment of hawk fire units this is something that will take months if not years to actually do so this is this again this is a headline that people will cling to but in reality is is just another indicator of how bad things are for ukraine it continues it says in addition the sale includes missile recertification components for older units, tools, test and support equipment, spare parts, and more. The sale will require temporary duty travel to Europe of an estimated five U.S. government employees and 15 contractor representatives to support training and sustainment, the official said. Just, just the training alone will take months, let alone any of the work these trained individuals are going to do, which they will not be capable of doing. They will need contractors to help, at, at a minimum, help them do it. The MIM-23 Hawk, a name that began life as an acronym for Homing All the Way Killer, was first introduced in the 1950s as the U.S. military sought ways to defeat raids by high-flying strategic bombers. This is a, a relic from the Cold War that should be in a museum because of the desperate state of the Western military industrial base. They are sending them to Ukraine instead. And we remember all those articles uh, condemning Russia, mocking Russia for bringing out T-55 tanks. Uh, they never really explained what they were being used for. They 
They acted as if they were being used as replacements for Russia's more modern main battle tanks, which is, which is not true. Uh, we remember all of that, but then it's actually the West that has run out of modern weapon systems to send Ukraine and is sending them antiquated uh, museum pieces, essentially. Now, speaking of military industrial output, speaking of uh, the use of older equipment, let me show you what an actual refurbishment and modernization program that, that could make a difference, what that looks like, unfortunately, is being done by Russia, not Ukraine, not by Ukraine's Western sponsors. Uh, there's this from TASS. Russia's defense chief inspects production of tanks, flamethrowers at Siberian Enterprises in Omsk, in Siberia, Russia. Uh, this is Sergei Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, handed down an instruction for the defense enterprise to ramp up the production of T-80 BVM tanks, the defense ministry said. The T-80 BVM is the most recent variant of the T-80 main battle tank. It is different than Russia's T-72, T-90, and even T-14 main battle tanks. The T-14 is not yet uh, on the battlefield or in full production. But all three of those variants have diesel engines. The T-80 has a turbine engine, much like the M1 Abrams produced by the United States. However, the T-80 is much smaller and lighter, and so uh, the turbine engine affords it more power and speed. That is the advantage that it has over the diesel engine counterparts, the T-72, T-90, T-14. It is faster, it is less fuel efficient, but it is faster. And there's certain aspects of the turbine engine that make, make it uh, more suitable for harsher conditions in terms of environment. This goes together with this article from 2023, September 2023 from Forbes. The Russians are making their first new tank turbines in 30 years, likely signaling a very long war. And so they're talking about a turbine engine. So they're talking about Russia beginning the production of new turbine engines for the for T-80 tanks. And in this article, they talk about the factories and how all of the tooling equipment that was used to make the turbine engines years ago, how it's still intact, it's still in the factory. All they have to do is, is pull it out of storage and start using it again, which uh, is in stark contrast to the collective West, which when they have excess production capacity, they simply get rid of all of it. They cut and slash it because it is a way of maximizing profits. Profit-driven versus Russia's purpose-driven military industrial base. This Forbes article is talking about how, while they may still have the tooling for the, the turbine engines and uh, they, they, they may be able to start producing brand new T-80 tanks from scratch, there's all these downstream suppliers that they would, they would have to find. And the fact of the matter is a lot of those downstream suppliers also most likely are, are part of state-owned enterprises with factories with all the tooling equipment still sitting around waiting to be put back in action, which is why Russia is able to do this so quickly. Right now, uh, these T-80s are being refurbished and also modernized. Uh, so I saw this... I saw this tweet online by a pro-Ukrainian commentator, claims to be some former US military intel soldier. And he's talking about how these aren't brand new, these are just uh, refurbished T-80 tanks, LOL. And the, the, the point is a modernized T-80 is going to have either a new or refurbished turbine engine. It's going to have a new fire control system, the most modern main, main gun, modern, the most modern optics, and also the most modern explosive reactive armor placed on top of these old refurbished hulls and turrets. So the, the refurbished hull, turret, running gear, all of that 
it is completely irrelevant if everything else is brand new and modern. It's going to give that tank modern capabilities, effective capabilities on the battlefield. It's going to allow these refurbished, modernized T-80 tanks to hit targets kilometers away on the first shot, just like any other modern, effective main battle tank, just like modernized T-72s and T-90s. What difference does it make where the hull and the turret come from if everything relevant to its performance on the battlefield is new and modernized? So it's not quite the gotcha moment many are thinking. And, and also work continues to actually produce brand new T-80 tanks. Russia has hundreds, if not thousands, of main battle tanks in storage that they can pull out and begin refurbishing and modernizing. And I just want to point out that, again, the, the collective West, because they cannot find enough appropriate equipment to send Ukraine, has done the very things they're trying to accuse Russia of in fiction. They have done this in reality. Does anyone remember this Forbes article from September 2022? Slovenia is giving Ukraine some very old tanks, but age can be deceiving. And it, actually, it turned out, no, it, it, it wasn't deceiving. These tanks were useless. They were given in in negligible quantities and they made absolutely no difference on the battlefield. Uh, the, the article says Slovenia has announced it is sending to Ukraine some very old tanks as in 70 years old. So we're talking about post-World War II T-55s modernized into the M-55S. They're admitting that it, it is not even Slovenia's main battle tank. They were in reserve and they were just whatever they had laying around that they could send Ukraine. And we never heard of them again until well, one or two of them were destroyed on the battlefield and the rest just disappeared in the mix. All of this together is what is directing the vector sum of this conflict, which is why we see Russia making these incremental gains on the battlefield. We see the West writing articles about Ukraine losing now. Uh, I haven't even started talking about Ukraine's manpower problem. Uh, suffice to say that, uh, and as I pointed out in previous updates, they admit that they have a, a critical manpower shortage. They're talking about this mobilization bill. They need to raise hundreds of thousands of soldiers. And as I pointed out, uh, Ukraine's brigades have been decimated. They need to basically rebuild multiple brigades worth of men men and equipment and they don't have the ability to do that they don't have the resources to do it and they most certainly don't have the time to do it i have talked extensively how long it takes just to produce an entry-level effective infantry soldier and as these brigades are decimated in battle as their ncos are killed or maimed as their officers are killed and maimed you need to find replacements for these crucial leadership roles, that takes years to produce. That is not something you could speed along. Of course, they're trying to, but there are severe consequences for doing so. This is a problem Russia admittedly does not have. They have a larger army now than they started out with. Ukraine, a polar opposite, a negative image of the Russian military. It is smaller, and still diminishing while Russia's military is larger and still growing. This is the fundamental issue directing the outcome of this conflict. The 61 billion just passed by Congress or in the process as I'm recording this, in the process of being passed and the, the package being put together before being published on the Department of Defense's website, that does nothing to address the fundamental problems the U.S. and its allies have in supporting Ukraine in this proxy war. And if you don't change those fundamentals, you're not going to change the outcome of this conflict. Some people have asked me, uh, with the passing of the $61 billion in aid, is this going to drag the conflict out longer? And I would say no. And I say no for one simple reason. I doubt anyone in Moscow planning ahead ever believed that the U.S. was not going to pass this $61 billion. They knew it. They knew 
whatever weapons the U.S. and its allies are producing, they're going to continue to send to Ukraine. And they have planned accordingly for that conflict. And that timetable, that time frame has not changed. It's a game that they're playing with headlines, with public relations, public perception. I don't think that it changed any planning or any timetables in Moscow. I don't think it's going to change anything on the battlefield. Ukraine was always going to get these weapons whenever they were available. They have not been available for months because they simply didn't exist. They were uh, stockpiling monthly production of all of this equipment, and they're going to send it to Ukraine now that they have a, a sizable amount to put into a package. And as the U.S. and its allies are losing this proxy war against Russia and Ukraine, just remember that the U.S. is still trying to provoke war in the Middle East, and they continue this buildup and this, pro this, this campaign of provocations in the Asia-Pacific region against China, whose military-industrial base is many times larger than even Russia's. As empires have done all throughout history, they only travel in one direction. They... they see that they're overextended the intelligent thing to do is to reform out of imperialism but the people making those decisions are ideologically psychologically incapable of doing so so they will just continue until they go over the cliff hopefully they don't take us all with them i'll continue keeping an eye on this proxy war in ukraine as well as U.S. provocations in the Middle East and the Asia-Pacific region and their interference everywhere else in between. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Please check the video description for other places you can find and follow my work. I highly suggest you follow me on Telegram. Absolutely everything that I do gets posted there, including entire videos, backups of all of my videos. If you don't feel like watching it on YouTube, Please go to Telegram, has has never censored any posts that I've ever put up, does not block any any links that I that I post. Uh, so please check that out. In the video description, there are also all the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel or any of my other social media platforms. If ads pop up, feel free to skip them. They're not helping me out at all. If you do want to help support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also through Patreon. To everyone who has been helping out, whether it's a one-time donation, donations month to month, or if you have no extra funds and all you're doing is just sharing my work with others, that is all greatly appreciated. That is what helps make this work possible. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.